Lecture four, capital, part three, the Garden City. As people who know what it's like to move from one century of, uh, uh, to the next with a great deal of problems to solve, the problem of the 19th century was industrialization, the pollution, the degradation, the poor living conditions. Uh, this was the big problem moving into the 20th century. These are the problems that needed to be solved almost more than any other problems. And the 20th century uh, got to work with architects at the lead to a large extent. Um, the One of the most striking and influential set of ideas uh, came in the form of the idea of the marriage between the best of the city and the best of the country. Uh, the city is where you had economic opportunity and jobs. The country is where you had healthy living standards, uh, etc., social connections, moral, um, you know, re understood as Christianity at the time in, in um, Western Europe and England. And uh, the idea, uh, Ebenezer Howard uh, was not an architect, uh, one of the ongoing themes, uh, but he changed everything by articulating the idea of uh, unifying the town and the country, uh, getting the best of both worlds. And the geometry he laid out on the landscape uh, was highly abstracted, highly idealized. Um, a central park at the center, grand boulevards that were park-like, uh, single-family houses and gardens. But at the core, it was still extremely high density, but also constrained with a circle railway that would support the industrial activities. And then the landscape filled with uh, new programs, uh, largely agricultural um, things, and then focusing in on the central city. Uh, it was The idea was a city without slums, a city without smoke, uh, smokestacks. Um, they moved it out to the periphery uh, along with uh, numbers of new programs that are listed here. And zooming in on the city itself, we have a, a strength, some very strong um, civic institutions at the center, uh, moving out on boulevards um, to other things, and uh, dairy farms at the edges along with uh, industry out at the edges, but a very the idea was a pleasant residential quarter, free of uh, smokestack and industry. Uh, schools nestled in the heart of the nurturing environment. Um, this resonates with some of the ideas uh, come out of biology. Uh, Patrick Geddes was a biologist, again not an architect, who came into architecture because he saw the opportunity to really. Uh, use the ideas of biology to make a better world. This is his diagram of the valley section, uh, noticing in biological systems uh, that different topographies and soil conditions are associated with certain biological communities, similarly applying these same questions and ideas to human society, noticing that different types of human settlements are associated with different topographies and natural uh, conditions. At the uh, bottom of the valley where the river is, that's where the cities form because of water power, as discussed last time. Um, factories, as uh, became less dependent on water, they moved away out of the cities. Um, rail lines, uh, as rail and coal, uh, coal power and rail transportation began to dominate. And then uh, agriculture on the upper valleys, uh, moving out towards wilderness uh, in the higher areas. And this is uh, what Patrick Geddes and others um, uh, used to illustrate the, how important and uh, natural that was. Again, the word natural used with uh, quotation marks. Um, this idea was picked up along with the biological idea of the transect, where you cut a slice through the natural environment and take a survey of population counts, etc., and you get a very clear idea of the settlement patterns. This was taken up by the radical um, breakaway modernist group, uh, Team 10, that, more about that later, uh, who drew their own valley section and um, proposed uh, the four different um, associations, um, scale of human associations, uh, more about that in weeks to come. And uh, that has survived to the present. 
Uh, more recently, the Congress for New Urbanism has proposed a uh, valley section idea in this transect of specific zones as a way to replace, uh, do the job of zoning rules, but in a far more direct and uh, efficient manner. Um, Team 10 uh, went so far as to propose extensions to the towns. We'll be seeing this again. Uh, but the, the big thing that happening in England was the idea of uh, creating a green belt around London to limit the sprawl. Sprawl was already seen as a problem, even moving from the 19th century to the 20th century. And uh, the idea was to build new towns around London at the same time to establish uh, strictly maintained green open spaces in order to uh, properly channel development into specific areas where the infrastructure could support it. One of the first uh, garden cities, uh, still Ebenezer Howard was uh, involved um, in guiding his guiding principles was the city of Letchworth, the new town of Letchworth, England. Uh, and here we see an aerial photo. Uh, you can see a rail line cutting through east-west heading into London, the uh, town square with radiating streets uh, coming in and uh, bucolic countryside on a very sharply de uh, controlled boundary between the city and the country. Um, here's uh, the Team 10 diagram of the four scales of human association. And along these scales, uh, they had a sense that the house scale was very much in hand. The activity of architects and builders and developers had focused primarily on this scale. Uh, at the city scale, there was the emergence of the, uh, the professional planning to break away from architecture uh, to take on large regional infrastructure projects uh, like the um, Appalachian Trail in the United States associated with the Regional Planning Association of America. Uh, and so there's at the very lowest end of the scale and the highest end of the scale, there was a great deal of uh, recent activity. The two scales that Team 10 felt was underdeveloped um, were the scales of the district and the street, and they focused primarily on the street. And this was also something that uh, the um, a group associated with the Regional Planning Association of America um, growing out of the ideas of Patrick Geddes of, from biology, Lewis Mumford, who was a, an architectural critic, a uh, cultural critic, uh, quite prolific, um, Clarence Stein, Clarence Perry, Henry Wright, these are the names, and especially Clarence Stein. Um, the idea of a neighborhood unit was um, came into uh, favor as the core concept where the at the center of a limited-sized neighborhood, um, roughly one mile in radius, was a urban um, community center uh, with um, that was very much dominated by the schools, surrounded by open space. And this was to be the civic heart. The basic idea had to do with the scale of human associations, resonating with what Team 10 was to say, um, around this, uh, this period, uh, a few decades later. But the scale of human association, what um, the Regional Planning Association of America, uh, these players uh, behind the neighborhood unit uh, considered they're a primary social unit, the number of people that we recognize walking down the street, kind of a vig uh, village scale. This was to push back against the alienation and anonymous character of the city that was celebrated in Paris uh, with the rise of the boulevards and the, the bursting of modern uh, thought, feeling, and experience that comes from being anonymous in the urban setting uh, was seen as a negative thing, uh, according to these thinkers, and they wanted to propose a physical spatial form that supported uh, awareness and social connection and familiarity and a sense of belonging to a specific social community. Uh, interestingly, you see the shops pushed off to the edge, the larger main streets pushed off to the boundaries. So they are not considered the centers, they are considered at the edge and that the center is the softest stuff, the open space, the focus on children. Um, keep this in mind as we move forward. Um, and here we see 
uh, what that might look like uh, physicalized in terms of the neighborhood unit. Uh, there was a specific population size of approximately a thousand people. Um, there was a, here we see the school at the center, lots and houses, uh, curvilinear streets. Uh, you can bet that there were trees, but very specific ideas about urban form that were directly connected to ideas of uh, social life and connection and seeing people that we know. And these uh, centers would overlap uh, and uh, at, at the overlap uh, you might put the high school and at the edges you put the busier streets and the uh, businesses, the business, the main streets. Uh, and you see, uh, check out the urban space, the open space pattern uh, shown as the stippled dot areas. Uh, you start to notice a pattern that becomes characteristic of one of the most uh, powerful forms of the Garden City. Not every Garden City form had this uh, soft uh, open space in the mid block, but this is the idea that we're going to be looking at as one of the most um, uh, compelling ideas to come out of this movement. We saw before the, uh, the evolution of the tenement houses, uh, this strong connection from uh, the scale of the building into the units and the rooms and the relationship to windows and the space outside the windows. Uh, and similarly, moving up in scale, the building forms uh, have a logic of aggregation and agglomeration all their own that yields uh, block forms uh, and thus the, city, the form of the city uh, the, at the top. Those are five-story tenement buildings with a very specific and distinctive uh, kind of urbanism associated to it. As the laws change to require ever-increasing amounts of light and air access to every room of the house, you see the opening up of the block and a concentration of dwelling units um, sometimes associated with increasing heights in order to maintain the same densities, uh, sometimes not. Uh, the important thing was to maintain value. And the argument was made that um, you could either go up in height to maintain the density, or you could use these schemes to reduce density and increase the value. Uh, not much is said about pricing out uh, the, the working poor um, but uh, the idea was to coax developers into a building form that, uh, they, that would make for a better city. And so we start to see uh, in 1912 this idea from Raymond Unwin of um, open space being something that adds to the quality of life, the quality of society, uh, and uh, uh, profitability as well. This one is much more explicit about the profitability issue um, appealing directly to efficiencies of layout. Uh, the upper scheme is the favored one uh, along these same lines uh, at uh, half the density of the lower one, but a much more efficient layout in terms of the amount of circulation space involved. Um, there's much less street in the upper one and much more street in the lower one, and the quality is much higher in the upper one, and thus the argument made in this publication is uh, in the same spirit as Raymond Unwin, uh, that the, the profitability to developers would be as high or higher at half the density. Um, and this was important at the moment because of the ups and downs of the building cycle. Um, people, I, I have a little party trick I do. I, I point to a neighborhood and I can uh, pretty much uh, identify which decade or which cluster of years uh, that a neighborhood was built because of my familiarity with the economic cycles. Um, almost nothing uh, in terms of residential construction occurred during the Depression. And you see during the 30s here, uh, there wasn't much going on. Uh, the big booms of neighborhoods, especially around Boston, were in the 20s. And then prior to the, the 20s in spurts of um, roughly five to Ten years, uh, which happened to be the boom and bust cycle of uh, the economic um, ups and downs of capitalism. Um, you also see the war years, and then the giant boom uh, after World War II. And so it's 
turns out to be not that difficult to place the moment of construction. Now, in every burst of construction, there are predominant models uh, for development that are conceived to be popular and certain ideas of urban form that are popular. Here you see uh, returning from the war, uh, World War I, uh, the idea of um, cleaning out the slums and making open space for London. Uh, what the Germans didn't bomb, uh, urban renewal cleared out. And so you get the Greenbelt idea, um, the city, the town of Letchworth, uh, here shown um, in plan. Um, the top part, the lower part, you see the, the town square, the streets radiating in. Um, back to that picture. And now uh, several uh, garden cities were built along this model. This is Hampstead in England also. And it's still there because these forms uh, turn out to be quite stable. Um, uh, and you see the interspersing of recreational green space between the, uh, the lobes of housing neighborhoods uh, centered on streets. And so you have this hard and soft uh, car network, pedestrian network pattern that was developed in Sunnyside, Queens, under the influence of the Regional Planning Association of America. Again, the architects Clarence Stein, Clarence Perry, and Henry Wright were the primary uh, proponents of this method of building. And in the 1920s, uh, a big part of Queens, New York, uh, was developed according to this idea uh, that we saw theorized previously, but here put into practice. And there was a very specific unit form associated with this block form. And the whole idea was to create space in the mid-block area away from the rising uh, influence of automobiles, which was to become the biggest single force for transforming the way of life of the, in the United States um, and eventually the world. You see a very uh, significant portion of Sunnyside given over to this model. Uh, these houses are still there today, and for a long time there was a gradual uh, privatization going on where the open shared spaces were taken over by individual uh, lots, um, the argument that uh, tax income was important, and by putting more uh, housing in the hands of private uh, individuals, you could tax it better. Uh, but since 1987, that process has started to reverse, um, and the uh, inner blocks are returning to the kind of communal usage that is characteristic of co-housing, um, uh, increasing the shared space. And so you get the evolution of these types of uh, garden city block strategies uh, developed uh, in several a dozen sites throughout the United States, including Los Angeles. But the most significant one turns out to be a 1929 project in Radburn, New Jersey. Um, you can see the important thing here is every house uh, is at the threshold between a car-oriented world of the city on one side and then a pedestrian oriented world of the countryside uh, on the other. And so the every living unit uh, has two faces to it, one onto the world of the city accessed by cars, and one to the bucolic countryside accessed by, um, by human bodies on foot. And this pattern uh, had its own logic um, that uh, was developed and put into place. And the biggest uh, test for these these thinkers was the child. Uh, the, chil the children, uh, if the children were happy and safe, then uh, it was a good urban strategy. Um, and you could tell when something was, was not good, uh, just look at it through the perspective of a six-year-old child. In the Garden City strategy, they put tunnels under the streets so that children could be independent in their walking to and from school uh, on their own, unescorted by adults. Um, and this uh, led to a very strong logic of uh, form um, that you can see in these plans and then in the aerial photography of the early development. Uh, the first phase, uh, not much else was done. You can see in later phases, 
the uh, very quick abandonment of this strategy on the other side of the road. Um, so this was just about all that was built and um, a little bit more to the left, but then going to a more uh, recognizable single-family post-war uh, suburban sprawl model. Uh, here we see um, some very nice work uh, joining the photographic um, aerial photography and the map. Um, this map actually uh, matches very closely what was what was built. And here, zooming out, um, this one asks the question: What if it had continued? What would it look like? So it overlays the proposed pattern on top of uh, the pattern that was executed. And the question here is, which side of that red uh, street would you rather live on? The one uh, of the, the traditional post-war settlement pattern or the Radburn Garden City pattern uh, to the lower um, left? Um, and another analysis uh, of the same uh, block uh, more precisely executed uh, using the yellow of the sidewalks to just map out uh, the different um, degrees of human access to the two distinct landscape uh, strategy types. And this strategy uh, is available uh, for the analysis of multiple other areas uh, all over the world where the Garden City strategy uh, has been deployed and tried in various places, uh, including Baldwin Hills, Los Angeles, um, where it stands as an island of um, human uh, escape uh, in the sea and an ocean of automobile uh, accessibility.